I've written maybe you can, maybe you can. Just wanted to double check real quick before we're going to get going at nine o'clock. Can you guys, can someone vouch for me, either Joey or Victor, that you guys can hear me all right? Yes, no. Ah. Is that a yes, no? <clears throat> Could someone vouch or just clarify that you can hear this so I can make sure everything's gonna be good for nine o'clock? Hello, I'm trying to verify that the audio is working. Can someone verify for me? It is working. Wonderful. Thank you, Claudia. We'll be going on at nine o'clock, so you guys are just a little early. Sounds good.
Welcome everyone. So today we're going to be getting into how to pass the NASM CPT. Excited to help you guys get through this. Before we get into the slides, there's about 55 of them. I will tell you a little bit about myself, go over expectations today, and we will go from there. All righty, everyone is on mute. I will unmute it for a Q&A at the end. So let's get into it. So my name is Chris, for those who don't know me, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm not affiliated with NASM, but I've taught over a thousand trainers. Since last year, I've helped over 400 people pass the NASM CPT. I've gone through editions four, five, and six. Six is their most current edition. I have my CSCS, which is my Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialist, owner of Show Up Fitness. 
and I teach personal trainers out of our internship. So we have locations, physical locations in San Diego, as well as Los Angeles, where people can come through our program. And when they're done, if they want to get certified, if we can get them to get certified and they go to your large box gyms like an Equinox Crunch 24 and the Lifetime, or they start up their own business. So I've been, you know, one of my goals is to change the fitness industry. It's very toxic in the sense that there is not much govern. There's not many governing bodies that oversee fitness. So anyone and everyone can be become a trainer, and that's what I've been trying to change. So I first started out training in 2006. I had my degree in kinesiology, but we're one of the few professions that there is not a common denominator. It's like a lawyer, for example, they have to go through the bar, doctors, they have to do their MCATs, they go through med school, trainers. We don't even have to train people before we start our profession. And that's something that we're trying to change with our internships. So I'll talk to you a little bit more about our internship, how that works. Uh, in my book, How to Become a Successful Personal Trainer, volume two is due out at the end of this month. Got a lot of time on my hands now since not teaching. We aren't working. Uh, we have gyms also in Santa Monica. So uh, just a lot of time to finish up reading and writing and, and doing stuff to be proactive. So in my book, I interview some of the top district managers in Lifetime, Equinox 24, LA Fitness Crunch. And 80 in the survey is 80% of trainers quit within the first 12 months. It's, that's crazy, right? And why is that? And it's because most don't have the foundation with education and most don't have experience. So how can you get experience? How can you become educated? That's stuff that I will talk to you at through, throughout this talk today, but the main purpose is to help you pass the NASM CPT, which I can get anyone to. I will say my claim to fame is I am not perfect with NASM. I've had three people fail, and those three individuals, when I, when I interviewed them afterwards, the common denominator was they didn't listen to what I said. <laughs> so if you wanna pass NASM, I've taught this stuff for a long time. I know exactly what's going to be on the test. My last certified through them was in 2016, but students will go get certified every month. And as you will see on our YouTube, I interview them afterwards. We get the most common questions and they will vouch that if you listen to what I have to say, you will know exactly how to pass that test. So with that being said, how did you guys hear about NASM? Why is NASM considered the gold standard? And that's one of the things that I'm trying to educate you with is I don't, when I teach in my class, I tell people that it's like, I'm going to teach you how to be a Republican, a Democrat, and a liberal. And at the end, you take the best from each and then you go off on your own and you be your own trainer. When you leave our internship, you're not a show up trainer, you're an educated trainer. And so I find with a lot of NASM trainers, they go out there and they get in front of, NASM gets in front of them because of who they are. So if you don't know who NASM is, they're owned by Blackstone. They're one of the world's largest investing companies in the world and advisory firms and they own Ascend Learning. So they have a lot of money, whether if you're on Instagram and you saw them on Google, wherever it's going to, however you came across them, or you talk to a trainer. It's because NASA has a lot of money and they have an opportunity to get in front of people. So they, I would say amongst uh, the professionals that I've interviewed, that are, you know, Brett Contreras, Tony Genico, or Sohi Lee, and I'm gonna give you guys some people who you can follow throughout this talk today. I wouldn't necessarily say they would put NASA as the gold standard, it's just a ticket into the industry. You got to think of it like that. So take NASA with a grain of salt. Uh, just because you're certified doesn't mean you're going to be qualified. So there's a lot of stuff in here that is, is good. A lot of it is bad. But when I, take, when I take you guys through this, my NASA hat is on. So I'm going to speak strictly to NASA. This is not how I train. This is not how I do stuff in our internship. But I'm just going to get you guys to pass NASA. So again, you can check out our online internship, which we're doing right now while our other places are closed down. Uh, we have one in San Diego, Los Angeles. If you want to be significant, you got to think differently. And most trainers are just going to get certified, as I said, and they're probably going to quit within the first year. You need to be different, and you will be different by focusing on anatomy, movement, and gaining experience. We do have, i got to give our little pitches to make sure that you guys are aware of what we're doing, but also I'm doing this for free. So I want to get a little bit out of it if I can. But if you guys know anyone who wants to become a trainer, one of the email spots, you refer someone into our in-person, we'll give you a 500 to a thousand bucks per referral. So this is Chris. He went through our internship probably four years ago. He is number 10 out of 3,100 trainers at Equinox. He's doing very, very well. 
And it's just really neat to see those that not only practice what they preach, but they learn the foundation that, you know, you're going to make this into a career. And that's what I'm excited to help you guys with. So our online stuff, here's some good reviews. So thank you for the online program. I feel like I've learned more in the first week than I did in 10 weeks trying to decipher NASM's textbook. Most importantly, you will pass NASM. I am very, very confident. If you guys have any questions, feel free to DM me. I will reach out to everyone at the end of this. Uh, we will be going over chapter 14 today. Chapter 6, 7, and 14 are 70% of the NASM CPT. 70%. So I have a study guide out there that has helped a lot of people pass it. And the study guide will basically just tell you, you don't need to worry about this. I'm not saying it's not important scientific information. I mean, for example, I'll say this a few different times. Chapter four, in my opinion, is, is really something that will decipher or separate you from the average trainer. Uh, bioenergetics is very complex and NASM condenses it into eight pages. You don't need to know bioenergetics for the NASM CPT. Just skip the whole entire chapter. You will be slamming your head into a wall trying to interpret the esoteric information and they're not gonna test you about any of that stuff. 19 and 20 are tricky. If you don't know, NASA, the CPT is written by a bunch of English majors and professors and they're very, very smart. So if you go through any blogs, you will see people talk that the NASA is just worded differently. In 19 and 20, just know the stages of change, one, two, three, four, and five. They like to ask about that. Chapters 11, 12, 17, and 18, you don't need to read those. You don't need it. And the reason you don't need it, you got to think of it, as I said earlier, NASA is a, a profit organization. And so they're very, very, very smart. The test is 120 questions. Put yourself, it's called the veil of ignorance. Pretend like you don't know anything what you're doing right now and you're taking this test. And you go through it. And this is supposed to be comprehensive. And at the end, you ask yourself, wow, you know what? There wasn't that much information about nutrition. What should I do next? That average mind is going to say, oh, I should go get another certification. So I'm going to go get the NASM FNC. I didn't get that many questions about performance. Well, then that mind is going to say, I should go get the NASM CE, uh, PES, CES. So chapters 11 and 12 are sports related. If it was up to me. I think that NASM should focus on physical therapy, rehab, NSCA, that's the strength and conditioning. They should work on sports and conditioning. ACSM, they should focus on the assessments and stratifying individuals. And if we're one big happy world, we would just marry everyone and it would be an awesome foundation, but people want to make money. So when it comes to the sports side of stuff, if you want to get into sports and conditioning, you got to go through NSCA. So chapters 11 and 12, we're not going to ask you anything about that. 17 is nutrition. They'll ask you three or four basic questions, 18 supplements. By law, they can't ask you anything by that. So there's one question they'll ask you on uh, caffeine, but that's it. So you don't have to worry and, and try to decipher through this information. So what I like to do is just set expectations. We're going to go through Chapter 14. I did the whole Chapter 6 on Tuesday last week, and we had a Friday last week. We had a great time, but I forgot to record it. So I needed to remind myself to record it. So in the future, I will put these out there for people. I will send out the slides. For a small little token of appreciation, if you can leave us a nice little Yelp or Google review, and that will be for our West Hollywood or Los or San Diego location, and just say that show up fitness internship is awesome. I will reach out to everyone though, but we will also choose two people for to receive our study guide for free, which is a seventy dollar value, and also one person will get access to our level two internship online, which is a two hundred dollar value, and you will get a social media makeover. So lucky winner last week, Tyler, he, we just did a makeover on his social media yesterday with my business partner, Danny. She's been through the loop when it comes, she's like freaking Doogie Howser. She got her bachelor's of science when she was like 17 and she's been just blown away the social media world and she's really great at doing that. So we can give you a lot of great pointers. Uh, I would appreciate if you just did a little tag while you're doing this, if you have social media and learning from Show Up Fitness or great trainers are made and you will get the slides from this. And at the end, as I said, I will do a Q and A for 10 minutes and I will have more of these in the future with your guys' input. So if you'd like me to do chapter seven, I'm more than happy to do it. I've even entertained doing a just a full blown Q and A. If you want to ask me questions, will this be on the NASM CPT? I will tell you yes or no. I just had a student take the NASM CPT one week before we were shut down and he finished it in 25 minutes. 
And so if we can get you that piece of paper. So I teach a little different. If you don't know uh, how I teach, you haven't been exposed to our style before. I like to educate on all aspects. So I do like to teach, get you guys thinking outside of the box. I think that when I was in eighth grade, I wanted to become a basketball player. I didn't want to be a journal writer and I'm a big advocate of writing in a journal every day. So I think it's, as trainers, you guys should, you will set yourself apart from the masses by writing daily, your expectations, what you're currently reading. You'll see that the words of the day, squaler, which is a state of being extremely dirty as a result of poverty. You have a foppery, which is excessive concerns over clothing. And the reason that I, I found these words just really fascinating because I'm reading a book right now on how to be a bad empire. And they talk about just through the, the Black Plague and everything that's going on back in the day, how there were some really shitty emperors and what they were doing. And these words were used a lot. And it's just really neat to see the difference in vernacular back then to today. So I'm going to show you guys a little posture check. NASA's big in posture. So am I. One of the things about posture is the most important thing you can take away is the definition of what correct posture is. And the best posture is the one that you're constantly changing. If you've ever been sick and you're in bed for two days, your back's going to hurt, but you're in a straight position. You can argue that that's a pretty damn good posture, but you're in a fixed state for 48 hours. So this is a posture check that I like to do. From the anatomical position, your hands would be supinated. You're going to flex your humerus to 90 degrees. You're going to externally, you're going to horizontally deduct. I screw that up. I put external rotate. And you're going to externally rotate, and you're going to adduct. And this is perfect posture for a short being. You want to see the emblem on your chest. This is going to give you confidence. This is going to elevate your testosterone levels. That's how we should be when it comes to posture. Again, flexion, I flip these two around. So it should be horizontal abduction, external rotation, adduction. This is where we should be the majority of the time. If you go into an interview, this is where they want to see you. They don't want to see you here on your phone and all um, depressed. Proud chest, this is how we're gonna get through the material today. So, some people to follow, Sohi Lee. Last time we did some push-ups, and I see a lot of really terrible push-ups today. I see the elbows flare, I see the butt sagging. It's like we're humping the ground, I don't know what the heck we're doing. To really do a proper push-up, you wanna look more like an arrow. Your elbows are gonna be tucked down. If I was training you, I would push you into bad form. By pushing you into bad form, you're going to internally rotate and correct it. You want to eccentrically control the upper torso and the lower torso, and then you're going to come up as a unit. All right, if you do follow us on Instagram, we have some funny face push-ups that I'll start tagging you guys in. All right, Nassim hat is on, let's get into it. So, program design. Use chapter six to determine what exercises are appropriate for the PARQ. PARQ is your physical activity readiness questionnaire of which you will have subjective and objective information that you will obtain from the client. 70% of Americans do not engage in regular exercise three times a week, 30 minutes. That is pathetic. It's going to be fascinating to analyze the data during this pandemic to see the results from those that have been unfortunately affected by it and the comorbidity mobility, mobility that people had during that exposure. So what exercises are contraindicated for my client? If you work with any type of professional in medical field, a doctor, physical therapist, they will tell you something is contraindicated. For example, if I tore my rotator cuff, I may be in a sling when I'm out and I'm working with a trainer, that client may come to you with a piece of paper and say, Internal rotation is contraindicated. That means you cannot perform any internally rotated exercises. So what contraindication means is you cannot do it or things that are not good for your client. So if you have a client that has a blood pressure of 140 over 90, it's considered hypertension, you should not be training that client. You need to refer out. Peripheral heart action is a NASM term. They love that one for which of the following would help decrease a hypertensive client. Peripheral heart action would be doing like a bench press, sorry, let's do a standing press into a goblet squat. So my heart would have to pump blood to my chest and my triceps, then it would have to pump blood to my lower body. So it's an upper body exercise followed by a lower body back and forth. It's going to push the blood back and forth and help strengthen the heart. What exercise intensities are appropriate for my client? 
Nassim loves this one. Stand up to figure eight for senior citizens. You will see that in chapter 16. They, nine out of 10 people that I interview that do the NASA, they always see the stand up to figure eight. So essentially I would be sitting down right here, stand up, walk across, go around a cone and then come back. And that's what they consider a great exercise for a senior citizen. During this, you will learn how many sets and reps you should be doing and how many days per week your clients should be training. You will find statistically, you're gonna get your clients to train about 2.2 times per week. I know you can't do that, but it comes out to 10 times per month. So my point is for you, set the expectations high. We're weird, we're really freaking weird because we love exercise, we love to work out. Right now, I would bet that most of us on the call right now, there's 25 of us, that you guys have been exercising regularly. We get off on this, our clients don't. So when you take them through the assessment, which will be chapter six, you gotta set the expectations high because they're gonna ask your professional opinion. How many times a week should I train? I find it interesting that a lot of trainers suggest three times, but yet how many times a week do you guys work out? We're not working out three times, we're probably working out closer to six. So I always encourage our trainers at Shell Fitness when you take someone through an assessment and you go through the sales pitch at the end, you suggest six times a week and you're probably gonna fall on four or five. That's gonna be significantly higher than the average, which is 2.2 per week. All right, so this sucker right here is what we're going to memorize. You just need to eat this, eat it up. You need to know the OPT model, like the back of your hand, stands for optimal performance training. We're gonna go through all of the acute variables. I really like the picture because it's, it simplifies some complexities within kinesiology and periodization. You can see that there's three different colors. There's, for colorblind, probably like me, I'm gonna go blue, purple, red, that you need to step up. So I was just on a call yesterday with Arash from the Prehab guys, and one of the benefits of our online programming, we put those talks in there, and we were talking about a lot about NASM, and this is a component that is across the board, it is accepted, where you need to be stable before you're strong, and you need to be strong before you're powerful. So notice the base. I love how the base is a lot bigger than the other working parts. So if you have a stable proximal core, the rest of your system is going to be able to build superiorly. So think of it like a tree. Big ass sequoia trees, they don't have a tiny base. They're really, really, really big. That allows for the tree to grow. So we need to focus on stabilization. Now we just may disagree on the definition of stabilization, but NASM, so, <clears throat> Periodization is a physiological adaptation of stabilization, strength, and power, and power must take place in a planned, progressive manner to establish the proper foundation of strength for each subsequent, subsequent adaptation. Periodization made easy is just changing up the variables, fit, and NASM throws in the E, so frequency, intensity, time, type, enjoyment is what NASM says. Greg Nichols is a top statistician as well as exercise physiologist for juggernaut training systems, and he has a really great article right here that you can in blue you can just click on so we're going to go through the five training phases so as i said earlier you need to be stable before you're strong and strong before you're powerful so why is it that we have a client taking a med ball and throwing it into the wall so you're requiring your type 2 muscle fibers which should be explosive and, and powerful to twist in the transverse plane which is our weakest plane and we don't have the foundation which is being stable and strong so we need to focus on the, the first phase. And for NASM, they're gonna have you do specific acute variables, and that's what we'll go over. You need to be in each phase for at least a month. Everyone, I don't care if you're a NASM head or an NSCA head or an ACE head, an ISSA head, whatever head you are, everyone needs to lift light weights for at least one month. And that is due to strengthening ligaments and tendons. You recall bone to muscle is a tendon, bone to bone is a ligament. These are avascular. Avascular means they lack blood flow. So if you were just, to, everyone could do a one rep max. If everyone were to go in there and do a one rep max, the muscle could pop off the, the bone. And that's due to the connective tissue not being strong enough. So we want to lift light weights for strengthening our connective tissue, movement competency of what NASA likes to dub neuromuscular control. All right, so this is what you guys need to know. When it comes to chapter 14, I'll give you the page numbers as well, but you just need to know the acute variables for each one of the phases, one through five, and we will go through each one of these. All right, so 
reps first. There's three muscular actions. Isotonic, there's two of them, which we have concentric and eccentric. I think the easiest one is a bicep. So if I were to have a weight in my hand and I go against gravity and pull up, that's concentric. When the weight comes back towards the earth and I slow it down eccentrically, you can also think of it as when you want to breathe in versus breathe out. So it's like a push up. When I push away, I want to breathe out. That would be my concentric. When I come down to the ground, I want to breathe in. That's the eccentric. Think of the eccentric as easier. Every single client, every single one of you can do a pull up. You just may not be able to overcome gravity on the way up. I can get you on top of the bar and you can have eccentric control all the way down. Isometric means no change in length. Think of a plank, think of a wall sit. So when we look at phase one, they love four, two, one. And for a squat, that would be four seconds eccentric coming down, two second isometric pause, one centric concentric breathing out. So one, two, three, four, pause, breathe out on the way up. You count each one of those, so that would be seven seconds of time under tension. Isokinetic means muscles contract and shorten at a constant speed. They love that question. I guarantee you will see that about isokinetic. Here's just a little example because they don't really explain it very well in their textbook. It's on a machine, whereas isometric would be a plank. Isotonic would be your eccentric and concentric muscular contractions. All right. Repetitions. So for power, it's one to 10. That means the weight is light, but the velocity is high. For maximal strength, the weight is one to five reps. The weight is really heavy, but the velocity is slow. Hypertrophy is six to 12. That's where you're gonna optimize hypertrophy which is size. Muscular endurance or stabilization, as what Nassim calls it, 12 plus reps would be the rep range. Now this is across, this is just the rep, the rep spectrum. One to five is strength, six to 12 is hypertrophy, 12 plus is endurance, one to 10 is power. Now you can, you can get bigger by lifting light weights. You just need to go to volitional fatigue. And there's a lot of great studies out there that will show you can do a set of 50 to volitional fatigue and almost get the same amount of hypertrophy as someone lifting a weight for 10. But for those of you that are probably like me, I'm just a big meathead, when was the last time you did a set of 50 reps to 100% fatigue? I would rather sit on a cactus. That would just be terrible. So uh, you can induce hypertrophy, uh, but it's just really, really hard to with lightweight. Sets, so these are the things that we're going to factor in. Reps, intensity, number of exercises, your level, and your recoverability. Generally, I'm gonna classify people as a beginner, less than six months, six to 12 months, I would consider you intermediate, and then over a year or two would be more advanced. But it's an in inverse relationship. So what that means is as the sets and go up, generally you're gonna find the reps should come down a little bit and the intensity's gonna go up. It's not always the case, but that's what you should find. So three to six for power, four to six for strength, three to five for hypertrophy, and one to three. I'm going through these kind of fast because we're gonna go through them again in each phase, and I will show you the page. I believe it's starting with three, 370. You just need to highlight the resistance portion. And, and literally that's just what you need to focus on chapter 14. Just know everything about these acute variables. So for example, which of the following phase of the, the OPT model would in, encourage a client to do four to six sets? They're gonna say power, maximal strength, hypertrophy, or endurance. So you need to find four to six would be maximal strength. Intensities. So again, which of the following intensities would be most appropriate for a client who's trying to optimize hypertrophy? 30 to 45%, 85 to 100, 75 to 85, or 50 to 70? correct answer would be 75 to 85, which would be hypertrophy. Maximal strength is 85 to 100. That means the weight is heavy. You only can do it one to five times. So these intensities correspond with the rep ranges. So if you can do a weight 15 times, that's roughly 65% of what your one rep max is. Notice how the lightest weight is power. Think of a baseball player. He can throw a light ball fast. You couldn't do that to a bowling ball or a med ball. The velocity would go down exponentially. So the weight should be, and they've shown in studies that roughly 30% is where you can optimize power output. So power is defined as force times velocity. Tempo. So uh, pay, phase four and five are easy because it's just XXX. 
I remember I had a student in class, he was not from the States and he came back the next day and he was all embarrassed because he got in trouble by his wife. And he said that he was trying to better understand the tempo for power. So he went into the Google machine and typed in XXX and he got some bad stuff that came up. So don't type that in, just it's meaning the uh, eccentric, isometric, concentric aspects. Hypertrophy is 202. They love asking questions like, which of the following tempos would be most appropriate for hypertrophy? You have 202, 212, 222, 421, and 202 would be a hypertrophy. 421 is always phase one. All right, let's take a look at rest interval. This is the ability to recuperate between sets. It has a dramatic effect on outcome. This is fun to do on yourself. I was on a call the other day with some students, and one of them asked, they don't think that force production would be that much less by doing a, a set followed by a minute of cardio. So I said, that's great. This is the cool thing about being what's called an N1 in science, which is you can try it yourself. So I'm gonna to post tomorrow a, an example of where I took 65% of what I'm capable of doing on military press. So that was like 400 pounds. No, I'm sorry, it was 115 and I did it 15 times. But then I started doing the circuit and I would bike on my ergo thingy here and I'd do that for a minute and then I would do some jump ropes and then I'd wait 30 seconds and I went back into my military press. And what I found was I only could do it six to eight times. So essentially what I did was I compromised 15 to 20% of my force production in lieu of what? So I think a lot of us, we, we fall into maybe it's a trap or we think that it's better to train in circuits. It's just a way to train. But you remember, you got to remember when you train in circuits, you greatly compromise force production. So essentially in that scenario, which I'll post on our main page, is I went from type one recruitment of muscle fibers to I went from type two to type one. So that's not optimal in that regard. They love this question right here. So as I told you earlier, they're not gonna ask anything about chapter four. If they were to ask you, it would be two questions. So in retrospect, it's less than 2%, but for those nerds out there that love to get 100% or more, I'm all for it, I love it. So you need to know that phase one for uh, ATP PC, a sprinter is going to be in that um, aspect of bioenergetics and they're more type two and they use carbs. For glycolysis, it's going to be 30 seconds to three minutes, carbs and fats. They won't ask anything on glycolysis. They'll ask you either on ATP, PC, or oxidation. So uh, which energy system is a sprinter in? And they would have ATP, PC, glycolysis, or oxidation. Sprinters are ATP, PC, or as a long-distance marathon endurance athlete would be oxidation. The two most important things, hands down, for bioenergetics are duration and intensity. That's all they will ask you from that chapter. Dr. Galpin from, I think it's four or 10, I believe, he has a great YouTube and it's free. He essentially gives you complete access to his teachings as a professor in kinesiology and he goes over, he has a good 60 minute talk on bioenergetics and he uses some good examples of like matches being ATP PC, piece of paper being glycolysis, flask glycolysis, and then a piece of wood would be more oxidation and comparing it to fats and carbs. They do like this question right here about time intervals. So your client were to rest 30 seconds between sets, approximately what percent of recovery of his ATP would he or she occur, would occur? They would say 50%, 75%, 85 to 90%, 100%. And this is, there's little nuances that just irk me a little bit. So like three minutes would not give you 100% recovery. You need closer to 10 minutes. There should be a little asterisk there. But you know, for NASM's point, they're just going to ask you, they always love to ask 20 to 30 seconds. So just remember it's 50% recovery. So when it comes to volume, what is going to determine the volume? It depends on the phase, the goals, age, capacity, recoverability, nutritional status, injury, life stress. I had someone reach out to me the other day and they said, how many push-ups should I do a day? And that's, that's such an ambiguous question. It's like someone asking, how much money should I save? I don't know. Well, how many push-ups can you do? Do you have shoulder injuries? What are your goals? Why do you want to do push-ups? How many? So there, we got to ask all these questions. If they've been training for a while, so when I ask people, how many push-ups can you do? We always like to overestimate. As Americans, we're terrible at saying how hard we work out. We overestimate how hard we work out by 50%. So if someone says they can do 30 push-ups, I'm going to say, great, I'm going to challenge you to do 10 sets of 15 throughout the day. 
So that's going to be appropriate for that individual. You got to also look at the other things like their work capacity recoverability. How sore are they? So this is, um, I'm not going to ask you much on training volume. This is just more from your own sense. If you want to increase motor unit recruitment, that's going to be more for phase four and phase five. Anytime you see motor unit synchronization, that's going to be phase one. They love that uh, synchronization term. They won't ask you much on that. So training frequency, this is just kind of for your own knowledge. Again, how many times a week should I work out? It depends. What are your goals? What can you do? How's your health? How's your capacity? Meaning if someone comes in and I completely smoke them on day one and they can't train for a week, I've kind of defeated the purpose. Some people I love to follow, Mark Megna, he's from Anatomy in Miami, and I interviewed him for my book, and he's just a stud, a complete hunk. I love him. And he not only does he work hard, but his mindset is just pretty intense. And he just posted something today with Louis Simmons from Westside Barbell, and he did this crazy hamstring workout. Now, again, Mark's in phenomenal shape, but he said this hamstring workout that he did with Louis Simmons, he was sore for almost 10 days afterwards. So you need to make sure that the – prescription that you're giving to your clients is appropriate. And remember, I give NASM a lot of credit because they do a good job of preaching to the general pop, which is 99% of us. So for those new clients that come in, we shouldn't be doing more than two or three sets per muscle. You know, keep the circuits to a minimum. We don't need to be doing crazy battle ropes and the burpees and backflips and all this shit. Just keep it simple, learn how they move, and then you progress appropriately. So three to five weeks, I usually suggest if a client, I had a client one time who uh, he was training with me twice per, per day and he would do five sessions a week. So 10 sessions. If I would have set the bar low saying that I think you should only train three times, you're missing out on a lot of revenue. Don't get greedy. I mean, don't tell every single client that comes in, they should be training 10 times a week, but there needs to be some perspective. I like the story with, um, uh, Bradley Cooper, when he trained for American Sniper, he worked with a guy who I interviewed for my book, um, Jason, and Walsh trained him twice a day for 40 days in a row, and he put on 40 pounds of muscle. So that's you, know, you gotta you gotta look at the individual and go back to these your your health, your your age, your capacity, nutritional status, recoverability. What is Bradley Cooper doing every day? He's eating perfectly well. He's sleeping nine, 10 hours a day with naps. So it just depends on the individual. Just remind yourself that you will begin to lose strength roughly 14 days when it comes to weights, 10 days when it comes to cardio. So clients go on vacation, that's great. If you're gonna be gone for more than two weeks, you should do at least one workout to maintain that strength. So right now, if you're all freaked out because of the isolation that we're incurring, one workout a week would sufficiently keep your strength and cardiorespiratory for a good, you know, four to six weeks. If you only did one day a week for the next six months, you're probably going to lose some of that strength, but one's better than nothing. Duration. I like this one right here because people don't, we got to remember what exercise is. An exercise is stress. And the more stressed out you are, the harder it is on the system. So the longer that you work out, your clients are going to ask you all the time, how long should I work out? Or they're going to do an hour workout and they want to go for an hour run. So just remember that when you train longer than about 50, 45 minutes, depending on the duration intensity, you're going to see this huge increase in cortisol levels. They're going to continue to spike. and Your testosterone levels significantly drop down right around 45 to 60 minutes. Again, depending on the intensity. If you're doing just a regular bro split, probably 60 minutes. If you're doing like a CrossFit class, probably 30 minutes. So it depends on the intensity. So if that were to be you and your goal is to put size on, well, then you need to get some type of intra shake with some carbohydrates to staff off that cortisol spike, get some insulin in your body, which will drop down your cortisol. So alterations in your hormones and your immune system responses. With that being said, another person to follow, Lane Norton. He has a PhD in nutrition, one of the best nutritionists and, and docs out there. He has a great, he's the master of debunking bullshit that's out there. And a lot of people are trying to sell you their magical immune system boosters right now. And without a doubt, the best things you can do for your immunity, sleeping right now, a minimum of eight hours. So for myself, that's my number one priority. Whatever time I go to bed, because I don't have to teach in the morning, I will put my alarm for eight and a half hours because it usually takes about 10, 15 minutes to go to sleep. I do not compromise sleep. 
when you get less than six and a half hours, your immunity can be shot as much as 30%. That is significant. So if you want to stay healthy in these times, you need to exercise regularly, especially if I always tell bros because we're terrible at this, but make sure to get at least 10 minutes of cardio a day to keep the cardiovascular system healthy because it's also going to keep your lungs healthy, which is really important to keep healthy right now, but also sleep. Try to manage your stress. Supplements aren't going to do much right now. It's just a way for an influencer to make some money off of you. And why anatomy rocks? So this is just going to take a small little cat and step away from NASA material for a second. I like to throw in a couple exercises that I want to fix. Last week, we did some jumping because 99% of people don't know how to jump. We also looked at bench dips because bench dips are terrible for the shoulder. So maybe you guys have seen, first off, I don't know what, what it is. I just thought this picture was kind of creepy. So that's why I wanted to put it on there. Don't be creepy when you're training. But this guy has a supinated grip. Sorry, this, this lady has a supinated grip. Supinated, pronated. So why anatomy is awesome is you may have someone, I mean, this guy's in decent shape. And if you were to come up to you and tell you, hey, let me show you a really cool exercise for my triceps. This is the best tricep exercise. You're going to do it. And he's going to tell you that, oh, isn't it harder? Don't you feel it working better? And you're going to think it's a best superior exercise. But when you take a look at anatomy, so let's take a look at the bicep, for example, bicep brachia. And by the way, NASA's not going to ask you anything on anatomy. This is just take a little side note. But your bicep brachii, bi means two, you have a bite, you have a long head and a short head. So what it does is it flexes the humerus, flexes the elbow, but also maybe back in the day you would see Arnold and he would twist in when he does a bicep curl. That's referred to as supination. So you're going to get the biceps doing three things. They flex the humerus, they flex the elbow, and then they supinate. So if you were to twist your hand, the bar position does greatly affect your bicep. Let's take a look at the triceps. Triceps mean three. You have a long lateral and medial head. You're going to get extension of the humerus. All are going to extend my elbow. I want you guys to put your arm out and feel your tricep. And then I want you to pronate and supinate. And you will see that your tricep doesn't move. Hand position does not affect the triceps. So what, it, what you have here is an incredibly idiotic exercise because you're compromising force production in lieu of what? Less recruitment. So there are some exercises that people will do that are just completely idiotic. And it's not like this guy's a, that guy is a bad person or anything like that, but it's just a lot of trainers don't understand anatomy. And if you want to separate yourself amongst the crowd of trainers where they say it's a saturated market, I don't think the fitness industry is crowded. I don't think it's saturated. I think there's a huge opportunity to separate yourself by understanding anatomy. Back to NASM. So exercise selection. They love asking about these progressions, specifically the upper body. So what would be next after alternating dumbbell presses? All right, so you just see it would be a single arm press or a single arm with chunk rotation. They love the stabilization continuum. So you, your client is on a wobble board. What would be a progression according to stabilization? Would it be a balanced disc? disc? Would it be a foam pad? Would it be a sport beam or a BOSU ball? A BOSU ball would be the most complex. So they love that question. And all right, so training plans, we have yearly, which is referred to as macro. Think of the macro economy. Think of macros for nutrition. Those are the big units. Monthly, Spanish, the word mess means month, which is the month. And then you have weekly, which is micro. Think of micro machines. So you have uh, micro, meso, month, micro, weekly, macro, annual. They will ask a question about which... Which phase, according to periodization, would be a weak cycle? You have macro, meso, or micro. All right, so setting the expectations. Now we're going to get into starting on page 370. We're going to go through the OPT model. We're going to take a look at all of these resistance variables. And just to give you some other pointers, so these are some freebies for you. NASA, I guarantee you, will ask you a question on SMR or static stretching. So static stretching will be done in phase one. 20 to 30 seconds for SMR, 20 to 30 seconds for static. For strength, which is phases two, three, and four, you will be doing SMR, but then you're gonna be doing active isolate, which is characterized by one to two second uh, active holds. And then power phase five is sports specifically, spec specificity, sorry. So that'd be like if they let the, uh, the exercise uh, prisoner squat. So which of the following would be utilizing phase five, the OPT model, some statics, some couple of or the 
prisoner stretch, prisoner squat, whatever. That would be the phase five. They love the zone question. I guarantee you'll see this. Which zone will your clients be in for stabilization? And that's 220 minus your age times the intensity of 0.65 to 0.75 for zone two, which will be anywhere in strength, which is two, three, and four, 0.76 to 0.85. And then for power, phase five, 0.86 to 0.95. They love those questions. Starting on page 370. So what you need to do is just take a look at this slide and just circle resistance. So in your textbook, don't worry about anything else except resistance. For this one on page 370, I would also circle the plyometric one because they do like to ask that one question. How long does a beginner hold a jump? Three to five seconds. I actually love how NASA implements their jumps, but people just misinterpret what they're doing. And then as you saw last week, we got a bunch of influencers failing their arms and doing just really, terrible jumps so what they're talking about is you square up with your arms extended and then try to jump over a book so you're jumping like this high off the ground you're just working on the mechanics of it we're not actually jumping as high as we can jumping is a type 2 powerful exercise and go to the, the OPT model you need to be stable before you're strong before you're powerful so they will ask you about that plyometric one they're gonna ask you about reps for phase one 12 to 20 how many sets one to three tempo four two one Intensity, 50 to 70%. Your rest is going to be zero to 90 seconds. And then your duration will be anywhere from four to six weeks. I guarantee you, you will probably see between four to six questions just off of that. So just a little side note. I want you guys to think, my, here's my big thing with our clients at Shell Fitness. So I'm gonna go off on a little two second tangent. So a part of the slides, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get this in time. Come on. Okay, good. So we're going to do a new share. So this is what a, an actual study looks like. So most people, when they tell you, oh, I've done my research. No, they haven't. They don't understand what research is. So here's an actual study from Eric Cressy. And when he was at the University of Connecticut, that's where I went to school, in 2006. And this is my professor, Dr. Kramer. He's one of the best kinesiologists in the, in the world. And this is the effects of 10 weeks of lower body unstable surface training. So I will put this in there, you guys can read it, but it talks about right here, I'm highlighting it, and it says, the results indicate that unstable surface training using inflatable rubber discs attenuates performance improvements in health trained athletes. So attenuates means lessen, it makes it worse. Such implements have proved valuable in rehab, but Cautions should be exercised when applying unstable surface training to athletic performance in general exercise scenarios. So that's just me being a teacher of NASM's material for over seven years. And I worked at a school that made me teach NASM for a very long time. And it's been known for well over 14 years that training on a stability ball, on an Eric's pad, on a BOSU ball, is not optimal, but yet we continue to see it out there. And I don't know why, personally, the reason I would hypothesize is because let's be honest, when you get on a stability ball and you do a squat, it's hard. When you get on a BOSU ball, it's hard. So what you're doing is you're freaking the hell out of your clients. And so I don't implement any unstable surface training. Our trainers show up in a stone. What we do is if a client maybe just sprained an ankle, I'm gonna have them get on a BOSU ball, that's fine. But other than that, we don't implement any type of unstable service training because it's been shown to be inferior. So that's my little push towards NASA. Now I'll get back on the NASA hat. So strength, they're not going to ask you much on phase two of the OPT model. Just remember that phase two and phase five are supersets. So for phase two, we're going to have a bench press into a one-legged push-up. That would be a superset for phase two. A pull-up into a single-arm cable row a squat into a step up. Those are all examples of a superset for phase two. They're not gonna ask you anything else except what is a superset for phase two. So for the resistance portion down there, if you wanna memorize all this stuff, you can, but you're just wasting your time. I have never seen or heard of any other question from phase two besides what is a superset. So we're in the strength part of the OPT model, hypertrophy specific for maximizing hypertrophy. Atrophy is when the muscle gets smaller. 
Hyper means get bigger. Think of hypertension. There's tension around the heart. Hyper hypertrophy is the muscle is growing. So it's gonna be more high volume and NASM suggests short rest periods. That has been changed. If you wanna look into some information from Dr. Schoenfeld, he is the leading guru in the world when it comes to hypertrophy. He will challenge their rest periods. And the ironic thing is they even have him on his board of education. Their rest intervals, you just need to know for the exam. So six to 12 reps, three to five sets, two zero two tempo, 75 to 85% zero to 60 second rest periods and again four weeks this should be probably right around page 376 i believe i don't have my text with me it's at our school so phase three you will be doing the acute variables on the resistance portion strength this will be right around page 378 what you need to know is your reps will be the lowest, one to five, sets, four to six, tempo, XXX, intensity, 85 to 100%. You want to be resting three to five minutes. You will be maximizing the intensities during phase four. Only question they're going to ask you on phase four would be around the rest period, the intensity, or the reps. They're not going to get much into synchronization or firing rates. Just for phase four, which is maximal strength, and I, I actually, in my opinion, I think that there's strength components in their acute variables. This is one of the better ones. Uh, this is the last phase of strength. So we have phase two, which is supersets, phase three, which is hypertrophy, phase four is strength. So if you've got, so pretend like you went from phase one, you're there for a month, and your client wants to get bigger, you go to phase three, you're there for a month. Now you can go to phase five if you'd like to. But after you get into the next color, you can go wherever you want. You just can't go from stabilization into power. So you can go from phase one to phase two to phase five, phase one to phase three to phase five, phase one to phase four to phase five. You can do all that. Power is similar to phase two. The only difference is you are doing a heavy lift followed by an explosive lift. So look, let's go back to the bench press, for example. You'd be doing a bench press followed by a plyo push-up. You're doing a squat followed by a jump. You're doing a cable row followed by a banded row. And the, just for your own knowledge, you won't be tested on this by any means, but the term is actually referred to as post-activation potentation of PAP. You see reflex potentation. Essentially what that means is you're going to stimulate the spinal column in a sense that it has this extra excitability. So you may get some more oomph the non-scientific word out of your, your set that you're doing. So again, the acute variables that they're gonna ask, which phase of the OPT model would have a client do a bench press at 85% followed by a plyometric push-up? That would be phase five. So when it comes to flexibility, you're still doing your SMR, but you're just gonna add in dynamic exercises. So that's your prisoner squat. So everything else, again, they're not gonna ask you much on Balance, let me ask you one question. Plyometrics, one question. Speed, agility, quickness, one question. They don't ask you much on that because they want you to go get the PES, the CES, and their other certifications, which I suggest you don't do. <clears throat> and again, I just challenge this. It's not that I'm making fun of you if you've ever done this before, but this girl right here is doing squats with five or 10 pounds. I would be willing to bet that she could hold a 30 to 40 pound goblet right here. So why are we compromising force production? That's just my question. And I think that we do this because it's challenging and people will talk about quote unquote, the activity of the core. Go back and read that study by Eric Cressy because they were able to find that using heavier loads on a stable ground actually activates the core more than an unstable surface, which just blows my mind because it's so funny how the argument that people will have is it's, it's better for your core. No, actually, when you lift heavier loads, you're going to get greater core activation. All right, so this is just to go off and just get you guys thinking a little bit more. And this is how I teach in class. I don't think there's a right way to squat. So NSCA and the strength side of stuff, they're going to tell you that your feet should be 10 to 15 degrees out. NASM tells you your feet have to be right straight forward. If they're not straight forward, you die and go to hell. I think that smart trainers can do whatever works for the client. These are two cadaver femurs. Are they the same? Not even close. 
One has an articulation of the femoral head coming in at 90 degrees. One has an articulation of about 45 degrees. I would bet my life that the person on the right could not do a deep squat, the one on the left could. So imagine me telling a bunch of athletes or people saying, hey, ass to the grass, everyone needs to get their butt as far down as they can. For the person on the right, they're gonna get a butt wink and it's gonna compress their spinal column and potentially hurt their low back. By no means is squatting bad for your back, but squatting improperly or to a depth that is not appropriate for you, that can be. So here's an example I love giving in class. These were two of my students. They're both well over six feet. So who's taller? We're gonna go with the guy on the right, obviously, right? Because he's sitting down. Look at the difference. So Chris on the left, his femurs are crazy long. They're like almost a foot, maybe six to 12 inches longer than Eric's on the right. So having longer femurs is gonna put you at a disadvantage for certain exercises, such as a conventional deadlift in certain squats. So you wanna change up foot position. So the take home from that is there's no one right way to squat, change it up. So the, the common denominators that we teach, that we still have with NASM is just, we gotta focus on the competency. Let's do large muscles first, multi-jointed first, proximal before distal, start light. Once you get that foundation, the foundation is large on the bottom, then let's get into strength. Let's go a little heavier. Then let's get into power. There is a right way to do things. I think that we get caught up in the semantics and people want to just make more money off of their certifications, which is fine. I'm all for, I'm a business myself. But when it comes to helping our clients, we need to look out for their best interest, number one. And you can screen people properly by seeing how they move. In the last review, we went through chapter six, in which we took a look at the overhead squat. And so that's something that you could go back and review, seeing how to implement that screen. I, purpose, I personally do not do any type of uh, movement screens. What I do is I sit down with my client for 20 to 30 minutes. I set expectations for that day. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go over blood pressure. We're going to go over resting measurements. I'm going to learn more about your goals. I'm going to take you out on the floor and I'm going to give you a demo of what training's like, but I want to see how you move. I'm going to take you through a, most of our girls, which they want. They want to grow their glutes, get a smaller waist, flat tummy. I'm going to show them pin specific exercises. I'm going to show them exercises that are going to be specific to their goals. So at Show of Fitness, we focus on a squat, a hinge, unilateral push, pull. These are the movements. And that's just one challenge I have for NASA that I don't like is they don't teach you guys the movements. They just teach you exercises. So it's almost like they're, they don't want you guys to think. They want you just to throw in exercises. I like people to think. I like you guys to get creative and put in whatever exercise you think is appropriate for that client. For a hinge pattern, which is going to be predominantly more glute specific, if you like to deadlift, deadlift away. There's nothing wrong with that. Teach your clients how to deadlift. If you want to hip thrust, that's great. But it's, a, it's appropriate for your client's goals. I think most of our guys, we want to focus on their upper body. Maybe you like bench press. Maybe you like incline press, whatever it is. I have found that for those that try to take a beginning bro through stabilization phase one, and you try to put a bro on a stability ball, he's going to laugh at you. And he's going to be like, this, I don't want to do this. This isn't cool. So you potentially lost a client because you didn't listen to that client's goals. So... That's the review right there. As I said, I wanted to do enough to give you guys a good five to 10 minute Q&A. I appreciate you guys taking the time and hopefully this helped you. I'm more than happy to answer any questions about the chapter 14 or just the NASA test in general. Um, if you would like these slides sent to you, you can just go to Yelp or Google, leave us an awesome little review. And if you want a little help, I can help doctor it up. And I remember that as a little guy like us, uh, reputology is really big, so that's getting reviews so you're able to get found. If you ever to refer someone to our internship in person, we get $500 to $1,000. If you were to sign up for our online and you get someone else to sign up, then we'll give you your money back. So next class, we're going to do our body mass equation. And that's, I get a lot of people asking what nutrition cert should they take. And I don't think you should get a nutrition cert unless you want to become an RD. Because of the laws and regulations, we can do a lot with nutrition. The really the only thing we can't do is write out a plan and tell people to eat less than 1,200 calories. So it gives us a lot. And our body mass equation that we developed will really help you make money off of nutritional consultations. I will also be doing a chapter seven next week. So just make sure to follow us on Instagram. If you have any feedback or you have any questions for me, shoot me an email. It's Chris at showfitness.com. I will now unmute for each question. Further questions. I'm, I'm bringing it up seriously. No, he's on. Oh. Pretty good test, anyone? <laughs> oh.
I'll stay on for another four minutes. So if you're, I'll stay on longer if you guys want me to. I know people can get a little quiet, but just give me a question and I can answer it. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. For Hi. Time. Yes. Okay, I had a question. <laughs> Um, okay, so I did, I have been taking like the practice exams and there is a question that keeps coming up, like you said about the XXX tempo. Um, and it does say that it's both hypertrophy and strength and they were both like an answer choice. I did choose the strength because that's what you said, but I was just wondering um, what that's about. Yes, it's going to be strength. So hypertrophy is 202 for a tempo. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 202 strength XXX stabilization 421. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Nope. Thanks for I have a question this. about uh, Mrs. Keisha from Houston. I have a question regarding the uh, online uh, internship. How long is the uh, online program? Great question. So, with Patreon, I'm not able to, one of the, it's the, it's on our platform, so we're not able to like manipulate how it looks or anything. So you, I believe you chatted with Carlos, I think, maybe, maybe not, but you just start out at the first video and you work your way through it. And each video is between 20 minutes to 60 minutes. They're very similar to this, but it's not in this format. It's just me talking to a camera. And you can get through as many as you can. I, you could probably get through four to six a day. So right now, since we aren't doing much, you could easily power it all out in a month but you can stick along as, as long as you like. And I am putting out, I call them Coffee with Chris. So I do those every week of which I will give quizzes. I'm always gonna give quizzes. Uh, the big, big thing that we're trying to push is as our internship in person gets more crowded, we're not gonna have availability for everyone. So then we're gonna encourage them to go online for two months. So then they could just come in and do our internship for two months instead of four months. So I think that realistically you can get through it in one to two months but you may find yourself wanting to stick around longer. There's no commitment. So after a month, you're like, this is just terrible. I hate it. You can quit and you can send me a message and say, Chris, I think you suck and I'll give you your money back. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I also have a question about the online internship. So how, how do we know if we're doing all these movements correctly when you're not there to correct us? Good question. So uh, you have full access to me. So a lot of the students will send me videos of their clients that they're training. They're going to set up the camera on, on themselves working out. And what I'll then do is, so let's pretend like you, you, maybe you're training someone or maybe you're working out yourself. So you're doing a, mm -hmm. a hinge pattern. You're trying to conquer the kettlebell deadlift and you're uncertain if the form is optimal. So what you would do is film yourself, send it to me. And then I'll be able to even put it in here. I can put it on our YouTube of which I'll make private so no one can see it. I put it into the online and then we can discuss as a class, you know, how's the form? Is she bending at the hips more? Is she foot making it more knee dominant? You know, what is the agonist for a hinge? Is it the glutes? Is it the hamstrings? Is it the erectors? And then we'll be able to get bigger questions from that. Or also have, which we will do, because there are videos of there. I train a lot. I have my, my, tra my trainers for show fitness. They train a lot and we record the sessions. So you can see what it looks like to take someone through the workout but then you can also see proper form, but also cueing. And we're, we're really big into service because at the end of the day, your clients are going to continue to show up because you're giving that great service. So you're going to give the CPU yeah. awesome. No, I agree, but I am definitely a kinesthetic. I have to do things to learn. <laughs> and that's why we have our internship in San Diego and Los Angeles. And as we continue to grow, you know, we would like to get out to San Diego, sorry, um, Texas, and then start making our way back east. Because unfortunately, most trainers, they don't have that kinesthetic aspect. So it's like learning through a textbook Spanish, but you don't really have any checks and balances. So are you really even saying that word right? Did you really even interpret that sentence right? You don't have anyone to, to check to check you. So this right, is the right. And that's and that's my concern, not concern, but that it's my question about the, you know, how can you properly um you know, verify that we are doing the right things in the first place, yes. right? Because I want to be able to, well, for myself, of course, because I don't have clients yet, but I want to, but I want to make sure that I'm doing it correctly. Yeah, yeah, so that's, and that's 
you know, we've had a lot of success with our in-person internship and we've had a lot of people just reach out and say, I wish you guys were here. I wish you guys were here. And it's the second best thing we can do until we're in that area. And All right. know, it's, it's better than nothing, but we would like to, as we continue to grow, we will have options for weekends, um, continue education credits. So you know, maybe let's just say optimistically, everything is good to go by May, which is unlikely, but let's say it is maybe May 15th, we would have a two day course where you can fly out and you'd be able to uh, observe the class and observe sessions and also get trained yourself. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other? I think I answered all the chat questions too. Ashley, I got you. Keisha, I got you. Audio K. Okay. All right, we're good. So just hammer away chapter six, seven, 14. Go through chapter 19, 20 a little bit. If you like to read, read, but just focus on six, seven, 14. You'll be good. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that a lot. All right, guys, have a great rest of the day. Keep smiling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.